hope your semester at Charlotte's going well now. <laughs> All right, now I'll get us kicked off in one minute here, 12.05, and then just kind of let others continue to, to join in um, as they come. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for taking time out of your lunchtime today to join us uh, for this. I think it will be a really uh, captivating and unique lecture um, from Abina with us today. Um, this event is hosted by NC NOMA. Um, and again, in, in coordination with Avina, and thank you uh, to um, those at UNC Charlotte who reached out to NC Noma and brought her work and her research to our attention to share with a larger architectural audience in our community. Um, it's wonderful, and again, we're really excited to hear this talk. Um, before we kind of get into it and I tell you a little bit more about Abina, um, I just want to make mention that um, uh, hopefully you've seen some of the correspondences and, and wonderful things that NC Noma has been doing over the, over the course of this year. Um, our next event is going to be September 22nd. Uh, that is a, an in-person event um, in Chapel Hill. It'll be a tour of the facilities at Chapel Hill and of the campus, and it'll be followed up by a, a really interesting panel discussion regarding alternate ways to practice architecture with a focus on university facilities. So um, if there's interest in that, we highly encourage you to join. Uh, also, learning units will be offered for that as well. Um, also in general, as we kind of round out the end of the year, just keep an eye out for some of our emails as far as um, general body meeting, um, a little uh, membership thank yous and things like that. Um, also, if you are not a member of uh, NOMAS at uh, NC State or UNC Charlotte or a part of our professional chapter in North Carolina, we highly encourage you to join. Um, we would really uh, love seeing your support and participation in our events. Um, we could also use more help, but uh, I think the more we can expand our community um, and our work, even as you see the big AIA symbol, the work that we're doing with AIA, uh, I think we'll all be better for it. So uh, thank you for that. And with that, I will uh, introduce our main speaker for today, um, Abina Atimo, and I'll tell you a little bit about her now. Um, Abina Atimo received her Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from the College of Arts and Architecture of, at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, with a minor in Gender Studies. I am also a Charlotte grad, so I am really excited <laughs> to hear from Abina today as well. Um, she is currently pursuing her master's at, of architecture at UNCC. She serves on the board of UNCC's Freedom by Design and is actively researching the intersection between race, class, and public access to transportation. She was one of two recipients of the 2021 inaugural Social Justice Scholarship. Abina is passionate um, to, use to, to use design to create equity in places that are underserved. Working with Diversify Architecture in Raleigh, a nonprofit that focuses on highlighting diverse professional representation and giving students from underrepresented groups precedence and role models for their own success in architecture. Abina hopes to influence the field by uplifting designers of the future. Um, and so, with that uh, wonderful bio, I will turn it over to Abina. Oh, sorry, one last thing. If you have questions for Abina throughout her talk, please um, drop them into the chat. Um, we'll pop back on and we'll uh, pose those to her at the end of the lecture. Um, thank you all for coming again. You all enjoy. Abina, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And we're going to just jump right into it. I'm um, just very excited to be here, to be presenting to all you fantastic people. And I hope that we can walk away from this presentation uh, just with a little more knowledge about another culture. So let's just jump right into it. So this presentation is adequately called the Gold Coast Construction and Colonialism. Um, so we're really sort of looking at the history of Ghana, West Africa, and the impacts of colonialism on the architectural vernacular of the country. Um, so to begin, we need to understand 
where is Ghana, what is Ghana, who is the Gold Coast, who are the people. Um, I think it's important to really understand a culture by the people that exist within it before we can even look at the architecture. So uh, quick introduction to the country. Uh, it's adequately called the Gold Coast due to the resources that were in the country at the time. It gained its independence March 6, 1957. It is the second most populous country in West Africa, right after Nigeria. And the Akan is one of the largest ethnic groups, but it's full of many diverse groups that exist within the country. Um, so important to note that it is, it can be seen as homogenous, but it's truly far from it. And so here's a nice little map so you can get a better understanding of the size of the country, the cities, um, and we'll sort of be focusing on the southern part of the country today. So I always like to begin by introducing people. I think that by understanding a country in a short way, you listen to the music, you listen to the language, and you sort of listen to the environment. And so uh, here are some clips of some sound bites just so to get you in the traveling mood. Uh, this first clip is a song that my dad likes. And so play that. This second clip is a more traditional song. Um, and I think that uh, by understanding the past and the present, uh, we sort of get a, a good um, understanding of where the country is today. Um, and so I'll play this next clip. And here is a sound bite of uh, the language. And then finally, a sound bite of the typical sort of marketplace in the country. So now you're you traveled, you've been there, you've seen it, you've realized it. All right, so this project actually began after I was able to receive a scholarship to go to Ghana um, two years ago, um, around the time that COVID was sort of dying down. And so I had to present my sort of thesis that I wanted to explore, which it began studying the effect of colonial colonialism on architecture, creating a proposal for the timeline of what I wanted to do, um, how I wanted to get there and how the uh, funds would be distributed. And then finally uh, taking that trip to be able to go. Um, but due to COVID, there were some restrictions in where I was able to go, but I made it to Accra, uh, the capital city. I made it to Kumasi, and I also made it to uh, Kofuidra, which is a smaller town a little more south. So we're going from the south and sort of traveling up north as we go. Um, we also visited smaller towns like Mokola, Osu, Ibri. Um, just sort of hopping from place to place to glean the identity of the country through its architecture. So the outline of this presentation uh, will be looking at the physical location, how physical location changes with the architectural vernacular, how class plays into that, the effects of the slave trade, how to tie that all together, why it's so important for us to be learning about these different cultures, and then finally a thank you to all of you for coming. So to begin, physical location. So we are going to be looking north to south, east to west. So it's important to understand that there is a tendency to want to categorize and sort of place each um, sort of architecture vernacular into its own neat category. Um, but oftentimes there's a lot of overlap. And so you'll sort of see as I go through these slides, there's a lot of similarities, but the key differences do differ uh, due to location. So we'll be looking at three main locations in particular. Beginning with Northern Ghana, the Kumasi region, and then finally coastal Ghana. So moving top to bottom. As I mentioned before, these there are many ethnic groups that are located within these regions. And so you'll sort of see the influence that the culture had on um, the architecture. So here's a nice map just so we can understand as well as um, the location, the environment, and how climate, culture, all that ties together to sort of 
realize our understanding of space. So beginning with Northern Ghana, um, what we're kind of seeing in this photo over here are roofs in a compound. Um, the construction of these homes in the Northern region had very particular traits. One of those traits were the circular forms. Um, the traditional house actually has no door. It's the sort of blurring the external and the internal. Um, there are walls just for protection, but community exists not only within those walls, but on the exterior as well. Um, the entrance of the house is an opening that's cut into the wall after the house has been completed. So sort of um, making a mess and then removing your voids. Um, and then the doorway is decor, as you can see in these patterns here, uh, to understand who is in this house, what sort of status they have within the community and their positioning relative to everybody else within the home. Um, they're sort of interconnected circular spaces um, with these sort of thatched roofs that you can see here. Um, they're not as load bearing as we're going to see in other locations, um, but you really get an understanding of how this space is coming together, these sort of signifiers of wealth that we see in these shapes here um, and an understanding of community and architecture tied together. So there's that sort of rounded opening that we can see in one of the spaces there. And so this picture, I think that it really illustrates that idea of the identity coming into play in architecture as well. Um, not sort of leaving these walls blank, but how can I adorn this to sort of express myself and allow the community to see? It's a mirror of myself and a sort of reflection back onto the community as well. Um, and so this really quick rudimentary section of how this construction is going on. We have that thatched roof, we have a grass wall, and it sits on a timber platform. So using the earth, using the materials that are readily available within the Northern region to construct these quick forms. And so there's sort of this consistent construction that we're also seeing. There's a foundation that is set before the actual circular structure is formed. Um, there's these clay soils, they dig into pits, um, near the material and the building sites. And then the riverbanks, the soil from the riverbanks are used to mesh everything together. And we see this in many other cultures as well. And so this sort of understanding of wanting a solid foundation for your house to sit on is consistent with this in, in this community as well. And so here is a nice diagram that I was able to find out of a history book um, that shows the sort of construction process of the time layer by layer, level by level, consistently sort of keeping that round form. And then finally, cutting out the home uh, for entry. Moving on to this image right here, this is another sort of um, image of modern day. Um, they do have many of these building styles that we can still see within the Northern region today, um, where people, um, they do live in more modern looking houses, um, but they do preserve their history by having these homes still in the community, still used, uh, maybe not for primary usage, but still wanting to have that identity piece within the community, within the culture. So the main traits that we kind of went over, the thatched roof, non-plastered walls, the decor around the doorway, this sort of conical form, and then no door. So moving on to the central region, um, this sort of lends itself to that humid climate. And as we can sort of see on the map, we're getting closer um, to the ocean, but there's actually a significant river that runs down through this region that um, contributes to the sort of architectural style that we're seeing here as well. So these walls are built um, to sustain the sort of humid climate, the hot temperatures um, we're seeing the sort of traditional style of when we think of a home, the four walls and a roof, um, very rectilinear forms, and then a centered main entrance. So the community is centered within the outside of the form. Um, we also do see ornamentation, but it is showing itself in a sort of different way than we saw in the Northern region. Um, and you're also seeing that the furniture, the doors are the main ornamentation pieces. So not the walls themselves, but the things that are making up these um, transitional spaces are what is being ornamented. And so here's a very nice detail that we can see on the left here. Um, we call these adinkra symbols, and these symbols have different meanings, and you can still see them in a lot of our modern buildings today. Um, and so on the left, you have these vertical poles 
that would be around the community that would have Adinkra symbols on them. Um, and then here's a video that I took when I went to go visit a castle that was in the central region in Kumasi. Um, and you can see those Adinkra symbols at the top. So let's take a look. So we're sort of seeing the variation in symbols. What sort of things is this community trying to say, trying to tell about its culture? Um, we have um, so God above all. Um, the other symbols relate to sort of messages of love, community, um, and being independent, but also relying on togetherness. Um, and so in a castle, these sort of symbols are relevant, um, not only to the culture of the past, but the culture of the present. Um, this as a community space, these are the kinds of things that you want to adorn uh, your castle. And that's my auntie talking in the background and she was telling me to take a good photo. So there we go. So the traits that we've seen here, the deliberate use of timber, which we saw in even that castle video, the deliberate use of timber, the addition of red clay to floors, um, we're seeing more double height structures here. We're also seeing decorative reliefs like we saw on the door previously. And then there's a greater generation on generational um, housing. Um, and so if we go back a couple slides, we can see that these rectilinear forms are much larger than the sort of um, individualized pause per family that we saw in the Northern region. And so you have large communities, aunties, uncles, grandpas, grandmas, all living in one house, taking care of each other in the same um, four walls. And so we're, it's not necessarily a transition from individual family units, um, but another extension of the way the family can be interpreted in a community. Um, and so now going to coastal Ghana, um, we're sort of looking at a uh, primarily uh, fishing based industry. And so these homes are adapting to that industry, that um, sort of commerce that is coming through. Um, the climate is humid, it's breezy, and the homes also reflect this as well. You're, you're seeing these windows that are sort of catching these breezes, that natural cooling. Um, and the home is also a rectilinear one, much like what we saw in central Ghana, um, that, that the walls are made from coconut palm leaves that are braided together to allow it rigidity and thickness. And we're also sort of seeing the timber uh, frame structure, and they're infilling that with mud um, to allow some more rigidity, some more sort of solidity in these structures. And so we can see that method of construction here, um, the layering, um, and it's really conducive to that sort of breezy climate, especially if you're by the ocean, you need your structure to be able to withstand not only the temperatures, but the, the, the liquid, the condensations, the, um, the sort of air that carries with it. So we're seeing that kind of construction method adapting to that once again, using those natural sustainable materials that are located in that region. And so we're seeing compound style housing. Um, and this housing type is still used in Ghana today. Um, central spaces for community, you have the different rooms, but each room still has access to the outdoors. Um, so you can really understand how the outdoor, the definition of space and the definition of what is a room, sort of it's playing into this idea of the outdoors is still a room, it's still a gathering space. These walls are just necessarily to delineate. Um, and so we're looking at more construction methods here, um, that entry to the outdoor um, and the sort of more traditional um, archetype of what a house is. And so the traits going over them once again, thatched roofs, airspace provided underneath and through windows that are strategically placed. Um, we're seeing ceilings constructed of woven mats and wild wide overhangs of the roof. We're trying to reduce that solar transmission um, because you are in a hot environment. You are closer to the equator being low the, lower down. And we're also trying to have a space for community to be comfortably outside um, while still maintaining the relationships that they need to. Um, so going sort of to current Ghanaian architecture, so as mentioned before, there's many ethnic Ghanaian groups that are represented, and we're starting to see that now in more modern times. So looking at northern Ghana, the Kumasi region, and then once again, coastal Ghana. So even within these three pictures, there's sort of some things standing out that you may have already noticed 
um, we go from a curve to a sort of more rectilinear form um, to an open air form. So beginning with the northern region, um, because this region has a high population of um, Muslim uh, practicing individuals, uh, we're seeing more influences from that Islamic architectural style, particularly in um, Kumasi as well, um, where the population of Muslim practice practitioners are significantly higher than the rest of the country. So you can sort of see that in the chart on the left, the northern region is at 80 percent. Um, Greater Accra, which is a more Christian um, community, is only at 15 percent, and then the central region is at 8 percent. So the northern region is really lending itself to those sort of Islamic architectural styles due to the people practicing the religion in that area. In the central region, there's sort of a return to form ideal. Um, we went to the Manhya Palace, which is a um, palace where old kings and royals um, would sort of host events and live and have their day-to-day -day lives. And this structure is directly informed by the traditional um, architectural styles that we saw previously within the central region. So residential homes in Kumasi, they're maintaining that vernacular, but there's also still a few that stray away from that traditional uh, building language. We're seeing more two-story homes. That's not something that we were seeing as much of in um, historical times. We're sort of seeing expansion of, of space. Um, rooms aren't just relegated to what's necessary, but they're also being re relegated to what can this reflect uh, about myself. And this isn't individualized to the palace, but the palace is just a great example of easily identifying those forms. Um, and you can also see this, this is sort of a um, office space down below and then a residential space up above, same sort of rectilinear form and the size increase as well um, can be noted here. Uh, the previous palace was actually built uh, in 1925, um, sometime after the uh, Ashanti War in 1874. Um, and so the architecture of the space is one of renovation. It is one of reflecting the past and then also trying to bring it into the future um, to celebrate the independence that Ghana was able to achieve later on. And then finally, this picture I thought reflected the sort of building styles that we're still seeing today um, because we're seeing the difference in material um, this was being torn down to rebuild um, a more commercial space on it. This used to be a residential space, um, but you can sort of see the difference in material, um, the sort of brick mortar ideals that are being used in this region today. And then finally, coastal Ghana. Um, so this is extremely significant because a lot of the uh, castles that held enslaved peoples um, were in coastal Ghana. And so the architectural style really starts to change within this location. So as we're going from the north to the south, the closer we're getting to the areas where these sort of atrocities happened, we're seeing the heavier influence um, on the architectural style. So the Portuguese were actually the first Europeans to touch the Gold Coast all the way back in 1471. And they built a castle um, in that region in 1482. And so we have Elmina Castle in Cape Coast, um, you have uh, Ed Castle in Jamestown that were hubs where these merchants were sort of importing not only material, but unfortunately importing people as well. Um, and so the pictures that you're looking at were primarily taken in Jamestown, which are the, the oldest districts located um, in Accra, which is in the south, the coast. Um, and so their influence can really sort of begin to be witnessed. We're not seeing that traditional housing style anymore. Um, we're starting to see the European influence, the Portuguese influence on these forms. Um, and we're gonna get into that. So this video right here, I think sort of reflects this style. This is something you'd be more likely to see maybe in South America, um, but here it is in Ghana, West Africa um, today. So burnt bricks, cast iron, balcony brackets, like we're seeing um, iron roofing sheets, Canadian pine being imported um, to use to build um, today. And then people are sort of trying to renovate the space to make it fit back into the Ganyan ideal. So you're seeing these gates for that compound idea, um, but this vernacular based on what we've been previously seeing, it's a very extreme difference, um, especially when some of these building styles don't necessarily accommodate the um, climates and the temperatures uh, that are needed to um, 
build in Ghana. So the importance of all of this really is the intensity of those foreign influences. It lessens as time goes on, but the colonialism still exists today. The country is still grappling with how do you move on when something as heavy as the slave trade occurred in your country? And how do we regain that sense of our own identity outside of being compared to what has happened and um, where we're going uh, later on in time? And so we're, we're going to get into class. Um, class, I think, is a really big signifier of the way that a lot of these buildings um, have processed after the point of the slave trade. So in the 50s, Ghana and South Korea had almost identical GDPs, but we have to ask how come South Korea was able to achieve that rapid growth for um, that country, but Ghana's rise has been sort of slower um, and a bit more steady. Um, there were plans for industrialization within the 60s. Then President Kwame Nkrumah, he wanted to sort of push these pan-African ideals. Ghana is on an island, it's a country um, in West Africa that should be reaching out to its neighbors. How do we support one another to build a stronger Africa? Um, but the destabilization of the country, unfortunately, is put us in this position where we are today, where the country is sort of trying to rise and trying to be more solidified but the consistent sort of destabilization, the consistent sort of lack of um, voice in the more worldly realm has not allowed the country to really gain its footing in the public sphere. And this really speaks to the power of the dollar. Um, just for example, um, the power of the dollar is a dollar, but in Ghana, one dollar is equivalent to five Ghanaian cities. Um, and so we're sort of seeing that difference in a country is a lot more than just the culture and the people, but it's also how is it in relation to the things that have happened in its history and where can it go today? Um, and so we're just seeing that evolution of the compound housing organization. And so as class continues to sort of stay consistent, the average Ghanaian is living in a compound housing organization. Um, the houses, as you can see more clearly on the right, is still using that centralized form, still using that outdoor space. Each room is on the outside and it has equal access, or each room is on the outside, equal access to the center. Um, and that's the gathering space for the family and for the community. Um, but we're also sort of seeing this idea of um, the sort of square form, um, not as much rectilinear as it used to be as land, the usage of land has become more sort of compact. And you can see that entry space down here. And so these are some photos that I took in Accra um, versus on the Accra on the right and then Kumasi on the left. Um, as Accra is sort of booming, it's the capital, it's where people want to be. Um, we're seeing these more open sort of plans and you know the sort of flex of wealth, as I like to call it. Um, people are moving away from the more traditional schemes to sort of uh, show something different and more affluent. Um, but in Kumasi, you're sort of seeing the more traditional housing style. And so the compound is really important within this study because it really emphasizes community. Um, here, this is a video of my auntie and she's making fufu, which is a traditional uh, Ghanaian food made of pound cassava and soup. Um, but we have a kitchen, it's inside, but we barely ever use it because it's much more preferable to be outside with the family surrounding you talking and preparing the food. So she's really going at it, but she's also having this conversation with my mom. She's also watching my little cousin playing outside. And we're all just sort of gathered together in this space. And so unfortunately, because of this sort of wanting to flex the wealth, there's this ideal of wanting to copy what is seen as I've made it. And what is seen as I've made it oftentimes is relative to the sort of Eurocentric understanding of what it means to be wealthy in this space. Um, but it's not a superficial want. It's not simply just posturing. It is sort of an understanding of the African identity to be seen as valid in these larger worldly contexts that yes, I have made it as well, despite everything that has happened to this country. How do I show that within the form? It is not just wanting to be seen as different, from uh, the average Ghanaian, but wanting to be validated um, on the terms of class. And so you can see this architectural style. I could open my window right now and see a house that looks like that here in the United States. 
Um, so thinking about those connections of how that also is influencing the architectural styles today. Um, it's not a pseudo sort of uh, reach for wealth, but it's just more of showing that perseverance um, regardless of it being slightly misguided. So in this unit, with this section, we're sort of understanding how class is informing the architecture as well as the still existing influences of colonialism within the country um, and how that is shaping the vernacular today. Um, so let's get into the effects of the slave trade, which I alluded to previously. Um, it's really under, we'd have to understand the brutality of slavery in order to really see the long-term effects that it had on not only the African people, but the people now in the diaspora today. Um, and so looking at this very first image, this is an image of one of the um, castles that held the enslaved. Um, if we're analyzing it on a pure architectural basis, these forms are, we haven't seen any of these forms in any of the previous slides um, besides that first um, Portuguese home that we saw today. So this influence, they're coming, they're dominating the land, not only physically, but also through the architecture. The traditional architecture is overpowered by this giant mass um, that is sitting on the coast and it's still sitting there today. Um, here is the entrance to one of the dungeons that held the enslaved. Um, and so the sort of um, the captors, they were upstairs, as you can see in this previous photos, they had access to light and open windows, but the people that they had taken were relegated to be downstairs um, under everything else. Um, and so we're sort of looking at the juxtaposition of the so-called beauty versus the horror. And then you're also seeing in, this is still in Jamestown, um, we're still seeing this architectural style. So the Ganyans have taken this room, which used to be, um, it used to house um, the traders, the slave traders, um, but they've, you know, repurposed it. They're adding back those Adinkra symbols, they're painting, and they're adding their um, sort of adornment onto the space. So the first domination, and now the second sort of, we're reclaiming what was ours. If not, the physical architecture by rebuilding, we will just paint over it and sort of do what we can to show that, yes, we're still here and we've still persevered. Um, but it's also interesting to sort of see that historic um, slave trade and um, the, the castle and you walk up one block and there's people who are still living directly next to it today. So the sort of effects that that has also had on individuals in the community. And you still have monuments to slave traders next to the homes of the descendants of the enslaved. And this is what the monuments. Monuments. So the tour guide was just talking, explaining that this is one of the monuments to um, one of the slave traders. Um, and right directly next to it was somebody's home. And so this is also just sort of a walkthrough, what kinds of things that we've discussed before seeing in the architectural vernacular style. Um, so the window shapes, but then that redominates, putting back the adinkra symbols, ornamenting it with bright colors to show that persistence and the perseverance on to the architecture. And this was particularly interesting. Um, this was a, uh, a church that was located in the area. Um, it was a church at the time during the slave trade for the slave traders to go and practice religion. And it's still a church today. Um, the building hasn't been, um, it's been updated, but it hasn't been changed in very significantly. So this sort of like symbol of what was and what still is existing in this space, a church then, a church now. So we're looking to the future now and trying to understand, you know, what are these understandings of space that we have seen in the past and what can it tell us about architecture now in the future? Um, so there's one interesting thing that I found talking to architects in Ghana. Um, they were consistently telling me, you know, Ghana used to be a, a matrilineal society and it still has a matrilineal influences today. And something interesting you're seeing in these matrilineal societies is this sort of blur between the indoor and the outdoor, um, wanting to have spaces for rooms, but also wanting to have that space for community on the outside, um, existing primarily on the outside and only going inside um, to sleep or to quickly cook or to quickly grab something, but then coming back to the community um, outside. And it's a, a theory that's being explored in both architectural and anthropological circles, um, but it's definitely an interesting pattern to see 
um, all these buildings sort of sharing the compound style that we saw both in traditional architecture and the more current architecture that we're seeing today. Um, and so now we can see a nice before and after. Um, the, this is a renovated building in Jamestown um, that used to house um, the Queen Mother, which that is a position in the Ashanti tribe um, where the women would inherit the status and the sort of monetary values from their mother. Um, and they would also be in charge of caring for the community much like a chief um, so we're seeing that, and then we're still seeing in the modern architecture that wanting to prioritize the outdoor space and how the outdoor and the indoor are as significant to each other. Um, instead of dominating the space and enclosing yourself and um, protecting yourself from the elements, you're wanting to bring space in and wanting to be a part of the land. And colonial, colonialism, it didn't only change the sort of vernacular of architecture like we're discussing before, the sort of signifying of wealth, the difference in the building styles and the deprioritization of the outdoors, but it also changed the sort of definitions of what these things are. It changed the definition of space. Um, the sort of definition of space in traditional times is extremely different one than what we can understand today of what space really is. Um, and this sort of idea of capital A architecture, um, the wanting these sort of grand significant um, these detailed buildings, um, but capital A architecture can still be that thatched roof. Um, it's just the difference in understanding of what those definitions are that colonialism has influenced today. Um, so finally, what is Ghanaian architecture to Ghanaian architects, the people who are practicing today, having all this knowledge and understanding of the history, how are they interpreting these things to build for the future that still holds that strong sort of national identity. Um, and so I was able to talk to two architects um, and they happen to be my aunt and my uncle, um, Chris and Ralph Sutherland. And they are a part of the firm Sutherland and Sutherland Architects they founded together in Ghana, West Africa. Um, and they provided me with this really nice diagram in Accra we have a lot of space that wants to be delegated. Um, we have a lot of opportunities to sort of tie this idea of um, tourism, architecture, and national identity together. Um, we're really pushing our commercial districts. We still have a vibrant green space and we're building up our financial district. Our civic buildings are tied directly into the sort of culture and the way that people circulate within Accra. And so how do we move and push that to the future to create an architectural vernacular that stands on its own outside of the influences of colonialism? And my uncle really summed it up, I think, in a nice way. When we talk about culture, we immediately think to our past instead of our future. It's important to be informed by the past, but what can we take from the past to look ahead to the future and store instead of sort of relegating on, oh, you know, Ghanaian architecture, I know that they use Adinkra symbols. I'm going to make a house and just put an Adinkra on it. But how can we expand that idea to sort of make forms that can stand the test of time um, outside of the influences of colonialism? Um, so vernacular is not a one-to-one -one literal translation of the culture. It's not just taking the Adinkra symbols and putting them into the walls, but it's also about the identities of what makes Ghana Ghana, the way that people move through the space, the way that they interact, the way that they exist within the space, how is the architecture accommodating that overall? And so we're sort of this idea of decentering the West. How can Ghanaian architecture move on and create a strong national identity for the people that exist within these spaces? It's natural to want to analyze and sort of compare things and fit things within the schemas of what we understand architecture to be, but by flattening architecture to a set of rules based on those Western definitions of space, based on those Western uh, definitions of vernacular, we really do a disservice to the culture and we flatten the things that it could teach us. And so at the end, what is Ghanaian architecture? After understanding the past, the present, and where we want to go in the future, what is Ghanaian architecture? It is sustainability. It is community, it is identity, it is influence. It's all of these things wrapped up into one package to create forms that respond to the Ghanaian individual. And so we're sort of synthesizing all of these things and holding that while it's important to sort of honor and recognize the atrocities that happened, 
we also should not immediately think of Africa as only the place where the slave trade happened and only the place where we're seeing these mud huts. We should still be proud of those cultures, but also how can we hold those things while also holding space for this sort of ideal of community pride and self pride. And so I like this bridge. Um, it's a simple bridge, but I think it also demonstrates this sort of idea of holding those two things. Um, there's a bridge that um, you pass in Accra that has paintings of the fight for independence as paintings for um, what happened during the slave trade, but it also holds these paintings of community and spirit and color and vibrance. And I think holding those two things at the same time, you're sort of seeing this. This is an apartment complex in Accra. It is adorned with the colors of the flag, red, gold, green, red for the blood that was shed during the fight for independence, gold for the Gold Coast, and green for the sort of wealth that exists within the community. So this sort of understanding of, yes, we're proud, and this is how I'm going to interpret that pride into beautiful uh, apartment spaces for Ghanaians to inhabit. And then close up on the sort of, remember the sort of adorned, adorned uh, forms of the door, we're still seeing that in this apartment space. So we're not dismissing these sort of lessons of the past, but revitalizing them for the future to say, yes, colonialism is still affecting our country today. Yes, the slave trade did affect the African vernacular of the space, but what can we do to really pay attention that, to that return to form and highlight it and celebrate it in the modern age? Um, and so another architect I just want to highlight, um, Miss Antonia, Miss Ofori, um, she was able to provide me with a lot of the history books that I read uh, for the three months I was doing the research. A lot of the diagrams that you see were from the history book that she provided. She's also a practicing architecture, uh, architect in Ghana, um, mainly working on sort of churches and residential spaces and using the past to inform the present. So why is all of this important? What is, what is, I'm sitting here, I'm speaking passionately to you, but why should you care? Africa as a whole is a country whose architecture doesn't really get to be discussed in depth. And people sort of think of architectural backgrounds of Africa as that mud hut, as the um, thatched roof. And that's perfectly valid, but we also should be holding, what can we really take? take from that to see the development of the country and what can we take from that to sort of learn the ways that we can incorporate that into our own building cells. This sort of heavy idea of sustainability using the materials from the earth that are only located within your region. How can we take those ideals as well when we're looking at a mud hut rather than just this is what was and this is what is. Um, as a community, what can we push in our curriculum to sort of highlight these things? We're able to talk about ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and while they offer us beautiful perspectives on architecture, what can we also learn from African architecture as well that has developed the way that we look at architecture today? And what can we expand when it comes to learning about architecture, not only for practicing architects, but our up and coming architects that need to see themselves in these spaces? Um, and so obviously my personal importance, this is my culture, this is my country. Um, and I was able to sort of not only gain a connection um, to my culture, but understand the way that I could use architecture to revitalize um, the sort of identity that I may not have current access to today in the United States. And so finally, I wanna enter, end with a quote and a thank you to AIA, to NC NOMA, and finally UNC Charlotte. Obi in Nima, Obi Tre. If someone doesn't know, someone else teaches. And so hopefully, if you did not know something, I'm able to teach you finally today, something that you can take along with you as you leave this presentation today. And finally, just a huge thanks for coming and sitting and listening to my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you all can hear me again now. Um, I'm sure if we were all in the room together, um, we would all be kind of standing and applauding uh, your presentation and your talk. I think it was incredibly captivating um, and a very uh, real boots on the ground perspective of, of an architecture of an African country and what that means um, and how we should use that and what we should learn from that. Um, that we probably a number of us haven't gotten um, through practice or even uh, traditional um, traditional um, 
uh, things and, and our studies um, in architecture. So thank you so, so much for all of that, Abina. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go to the chat and see if we have any questions. Lots of praise and applause, of course. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to drop them into the chat for Abina. I see a question in the Q and A. Um, oh, okay. The bridge that I was showing previously, the name of that bridge, the specific name of the bridge is actually leaving my mind right now. But it is located in Accra, um, sort of when you're heading towards um, the. Um, there's a road that you can take to go to Osu, and you pass right under that bridge. Um, I cannot. The name is escaping me right now. But thank you for asking that question. Yeah, it's located in Accra, um, sort of near the Accra Mall. It's near the Akram Mall. Yeah, so while I'm thinking, Chad, actually, I have a question for you. Um, I think, um, you know, as we sort of move forward and practice, there are a number of projects, and I think there's this sort of renaissance happening, especially with like um, in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement and all of that. The discussion about diversity and representation in architecture has really been kind of propelled to the forefront of what we do. Um, so that said, is, you know, it's kind of investigating, and you, and you touched on the extent to which you incorporate this into an architecture, right? Like, is it something that, you know, you kind of go back in and reoccupy it and um, put, use the Adinkra symbols on, or, you know, do you dig deeper and does it become richer? Um, can you talk a little bit about your opinion um, on the value, or at least even potentially using the Adinkra symbol um, architecturally and decoratively as at least a starting point. Um, and what that, is there value in that? What does that mean uh, and, and that sort of thing? It's been a lovely question. That's, I think that's absolutely hitting the sort of point that I was hoping to um, push that um, there really is value in these sort of non-architectural markers that people who aren't familiar with architecture can begin to understand about the space. Um, and so even, let's say somebody who has no sort of familiarity with what architecture is, what kinds of things can they immediately look at to a building and then gain from that space just simply by looking at it. And I think using the Adinkra symbol as like a the sort of beginning point as sort of the image of adornment can really say a lot to, okay, this is a space that has this meaning based on this symbol. I'm understanding what the space is used for or the sort of experience I'm about to have in this space or even in some areas using the form of the Adinkra to uh, build the building um, that could even uh, delegate itself to uh, a better understanding of what that space holds. And so I think it's very valuable to sort of these non-immediate markers that non-architects may not understand, they can still look to and understand what the architecture is trying to say to them as an individual. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pause and look in the chat. I have like a million questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing some Q and A questions. Um, <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Let me look. This first question: Was it my aunt and uncle who inspired me to pursue architecture? Great question. I love them, um, but it actually wasn't them. I didn't really even know that I wanted to be an architect until I had applied for school, and I said, you know, I love art. I love science. Um, and where can I fit in? Um, and as I learned more about architecture, I did eventually talk to them about their experiences. I found that um, I think it was the best area, not only for my skills, but something that I grew to love and be passionate about, particularly because, you know, if we're looking at these statistics, there's only 0.03% of Black female architects that are practicing today. Um, so what kinds of things can we do not only to be representation, but also what can we do to inspire and create spaces for others to want to join us as well. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And another I question had the next one. I'll, I'll read yeah. the next one. Please do. <laughs> um, so um, has there been any interest in taking down any of the buildings or monuments connected to enslavers and the slave trade? Yeah, um, it's it's a contentious sort of discussion because you know, you don't want to erase sort of what has happened. And there's, you know, people in the camp, they're like, we need to leave every single thing untouched because it does tell that story of the attitudes of the time. Um, but then there is another camp that's like, yeah, yeah, it's important to preserve these things. 
but we're also still trying to exist in these spaces and we have to live directly next to it and see it. And so um, there's two sort of camps and as you know, political entities enter the conversation, things may change, um, but it's an ongoing conversation. I don't know is gonna have a simple answer just yet. Okay. Um, I will read the next question. So what architecture type are you pursuing in the US or do your designs touch on the Ghanaian architecture in your projects? Yeah, I'm exploring um, my sort of options. I was able to do a fantastic internship this summer at Smith Slovic Residential Design. Um, and they taught me so much about res residential design that um, it sort of ignited a, a passion for it a little bit. Um, but I'm also, you know, as a student pursuing different things. And um, my last project was to design a school. And so in that school, I was using those Adinkra symbols to adorn it. Um, and so I'm just exploring my avenues and seeing where my knowledge can sort of take me and lead me in architecture. Thank you for that. Okay. Still have time for um, maybe one or two more questions if anybody has it. Um, I will ask a quick follow-up question. I think we were talking about uh, the interest in taking down um, monuments in those two camps. Um, you know, with your experience there and then also kind of practicing in the United States right now, and I think we're seeing um, also contending with this erasure, right, um, or how we handle that within the built environment. Just do you have, have you started to form any personal opinions or views about the appropriateness of erasure or, you know, how we might go about beginning to talk about when it's in, when we employ it versus not and in between, but I'm just curious about what your specific perspective is. Yeah, um, I, I admit that when I went, um, you know, it, there was this, you know, we had just come off of the 2020 protests and, you know, we were consistently seeing people tearing down um, these statues of um, these sort of um, people who held ideals that were very harmful. Um, and so when I saw that, the sort of immediate reaction was like, oh man, like I just wish that that wasn't there. Um, but then sort of talking to the people and seeing the way that they existed next to the space and getting their sort of opinion on it, um, it sort of led me to want to take a step back and say that maybe the people who are actually living on the space should be the main ones and the main voices that we're sort of raising up. Um, and even if I may not agree with their, um, some of them did not mind having the statue there and not mind having um, these sort of living next to these monuments. Um, I still think that also speaks to the way that they've had to exist next to it for that long. And that in itself tells a story. So I was of the opinion of, you know, I don't even want to see it, but also understanding that, you know, I don't currently live there every day. And so their experience next to these buildings may be an extremely different one. And um, it's valid for them to have the feelings that they do about those buildings. Great. Well, I know uh, we've got three minutes left, and I know people are hungry and they really want to grab some food and um, kind of take that in before returning to your work day. We certainly want to give you time to do that. But again, um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Abina, for such a wonderful um, and compelling talk. Um, and we hope, of course, as you, um, you know, go through your, the rest of your time at UNC Charlotte um, and, you know, start to make waves in the professional community, we're excited to see what you have going on next. Um, and, you know, I hope that this research, you know, for you continues and, and maybe even expands uh, to other countries. And I think it'd be really interesting um, to see, you know, there, it, there being a Ghana version and maybe some of the surrounding areas and, and really just kind of building out um, the, the depth of knowledge that lies in like the architecture um, in that continent. So thank you so, so much for this. It's great. Thank you for having me. It's just been a fantastic experience. Thank you. All right. And with that, you all have a good one. Goodbye, everybody.